The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. We have F. Lee Bailey. Um, thank you very much for being on the show. You're welcome. It's an absolute honor to speak with you, Mr. Bailey. Well, that's very kind of you. Uh, you've done so many cases. Just incredible. You've had quite the career, and uh, you must be pretty pleased. Um, out of all the cases you've done, is there one that uh, stays with you now? Uh, not necessarily the most popular, of course, but is there a case that uh, you think about a lot? Well, I think about those that suddenly pop into mind for some reason they get resurrected uh, from time to time, but the two cases that I think you're looking for are of very different types, but they're both cases about murder. One is Dr. Sam Shepard, who became the TV show The Fugitive, who became the movie The Fugitive, and whom I got out of a life sentence and defended on retrial and who was acquitted, and then tragically, after he died, probably OD, um, DNA evidence came forward that, although belated, showed that there was someone else in the house that night where the murder occurred, and oddly enough, the prosecution had stipulated if there was any proof someone else was there, they wouldn't charge Dr. Shepard. So, Essentially, they put the burden on the defense before the even was indicted. I remember, I, I actually was assigned this case in college to actually write a term paper about the uh, Sam Shepard case. Well, it's still one of the most perplexing and widely known cases in the history of American murder cases, but more than that, it set the standard for the balance between the press and the right to a fair trial. And it's still being navigated and fleshed out. I've been part of it most of the way since I argued that case and had the privilege of having Justice Tom Clark say to me, did you like my opinion in the Shepard case? And I said, Your Honor, I thought it was wonderful, which is a way of saying, yes, we won. Um, he said, well, you should. I took it right out of your briefs, and I'll carry that bit of flattery to my grave. <laughs> well, part of part of what made Sam Shepard so famous, you know, that the case itself was, you know, number one, you know, the one-armed man, but he was also denied due process. Um, for the listeners, would you explain a little bit about that? Well, I think the best source that one could go to, because one shouldn't always take a lawyer's enthusiasm as gospel when he's talking about a client, particularly in a case that he has won, when lawyers tend to get effusive. But if one is to look back in history, the 1964 opinion in the U.S. District Court in the Southern District of Ohio written by Chief Judge Carl Weinman, who was a lion of the judge, said this, said, I have found five constitutional flaws in the Shepard Conviction, each of which would warrant a new trial on its own. And combined, and he said there are more, and I would see if I continue to review these files. But he said this case was a travesty of justice, and that's about the strongest rebuke I've ever seen the state court system given by a federal judge. And that yes. opinion was upheld in the U.S. Supreme Court. We've heard the story about uh, uh, Dorothy Kilgallen. Uh, we had one of the guests on earlier talking about uh, how she got involved in the Sam Shepard trial. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I can, because it's fascinating. She was there right at the very beginning. And I brought her into the case 
late in the day just before we got him out there. And it happened this way. Dorothy Kilgallen, apart from her participation in one of the game shows, was a very, very bright woman, and her father, Jim Kilgallen, was a well-known and respected a crime reporter in the New York area. Dorothy, in her capacity as a reporter, went to see the trial judge in the first trial, 1954, whose name was Edward Blythin. And he was very flattered that a reporter of her national import would show up in his humble little court in Cuyahoga County, of Ohio, and he invited her into his chambers, and he was very cordial. He was then running for re-election, which is unfortunate, and he said, Miss Kilgallen, why have you come to uh, the old Cleveland here to cover this case? You're a woman of great national importance, and she said, Judge Python, you've got a who done it here? And a real who done it? And <clears throat> the America is fascinated. And Blyton said, "Well, no, who done it? It's clear that Shepard did it." And then he proceeded to sit on the case as a neutral judge. This evidence was new because it had never been surfaced before. I learned about it by attending a talk in New York where it was mentioned and I went to see her and see she told me all the details. So we took her deposition and that was filed before the federal judge. And so the Supreme Court really turned the Shepard case not so much on a black eye against the press or a, a hair shirt. They turned it on the judge by saying it is up to the judge to balance the interest of the fair trial and the free press, and fair trial should trump, but the press is not to be squelched. And that is the rule of law pretty much today in the United States, and frankly, by different bits of language, uh, I think in most Anglo-American countries. I guess this isn't really fair, but did, did you have an opinion on that? Because there's a lot of rumor that uh, she was probably murdered and not uh, died of an overdose of, of alcohol and drugs. Did you have an opinion on that ever? I spent not a night, but an evening with Dorothy Kilgallen because after Sam Shepard was released, she came to town to interview him. Um, and I invited her to have a couple of drinks at my hotel because I was great, very grateful that she had stood up after all those years and correctly recited what the judge said, which ordinarily a reporter, as you guys know, would never do. You don't identify sources for anything, but he was dead, and the greater injustice was that Sam Sherman was in jail, she had watched the trial, uh, was satisfied that he should have been acquitted, and uh, so she came forward. I spent two or three hours with her, drinking uh, more than one cocktail, and as the evening went on, I could see that Dorothy was despondent and um, in a terrible state of mind. And I did not try to do anything heroic to help her, but I was concerned about it. And the next thing I heard a few days later, she killed herself. Hmm. Wow. I have no reason to think that she was murdered, and from her station in life, I think at least the underground would have put out a current of information if somebody had knocked her off, because that's a level of information that the press seldom gets to look in on. Now, Mr. Bailey, when I did my homework on you, I uh, came across the Ernest Medina case, 
And, you know, I, I'm a little bit sympathetic towards that case because my father is a Vietnam vet. Um, would you mind talking about that for just a couple of minutes and your involvement in that case? Um, it shows the length and depth of your research because you, you had asked me, okay, you told us about the Shepherd case. What was the second one? It was Captain Ernest Medina. And as your father could have told you, the whole Vietnam not war was terribly distasteful. Uh, yes, and this was, this was the nadir, the very bottom point of all the ugliness, ugliness in the Vietnam War. A captain named Medina, who was a company commander, had several platoons under him, one of which was headed by a lieutenant named Cali, and they were told in defense of everybody that in the village of Eli 4, you're going to encounter combatants, soldiers for the other side, and you should go in shooting and take them out, and then kill all the livestock so that the families won't come back to the village. And oh, boy. Soldiers move on. The intelligence was bad. Medina was not there. He arrived after it happened. But Kelly and his platoon went into the Eli 4 and found no combatants. They found women holding infants in their arms children by their hands, elderly people, and other minors, not yet adults. In the Vietnam in those days, if you were 11 or 12, they put you in uniform. And Kelly yes. and his crew shot all those people, those babies, those women, and so forth, in a trench. And then the army covered up at least those in the army that know about it. Medina covered it up too, but he never got charged with that. They were looking for bigger fish. Cali got convicted. Medina was charged with killing 102 people, 100 of whom were unnamed. The thing I liked about the case, because it is on his face, and certainly as it emerged in Time Magazine in 1969 with bloody photographs from an army photographer who was on the scene and recorded the event. It was absolutely filthy and I think anathema to everything that this country believes in or at least says that it does. On the other side, this was a tough case with conflicts all over the place. Uh, the Army wanted liability cut off at a junior level. In other words, if Cali was guilty and Medina was guilty, his commanding officer didn't know enough to be guilty, etc. And mm -hmm. ultimately, Cali and Medina and Colonel Henderson were tried. But Medina came to me. I agreed to defend him for 3000 bucks, which he put up. I had a couple of superb, and this begins the good part, superb lawyers, one of whom was Harry Truman's grandnephew, and the other was Mike Kadish from Atlanta, and they were assigned to me to assist in defending Medina, and they were wonderful, and I hired both of them the minute I could get them out of uniform. The prosecutor was a tough guy, a fair guy, and the judge was superb. So they were people that understood the military mindset, in other words. I understood the military mindset because that's where I was trained. And I think although a young man is pretty senior to everybody in the courtroom, <clears throat> the military mindset is make sure you don't convict an innocent person. Because the yes, truth because is you, were, know it. you were a Marine. I was a Marine, and uh, that yes, message sir. was very strong in the Marine Corps. If you convict innocent people in the military, even a couple, you won't get re-enlistment, and when the draft is not active, your 
ranks will thin out, so don't let it happen. That was our concentration. I wish it were the rule of law in the civilian sector, because uh, there is so much politics that infuses and I think infects the civilian sector, both state and federal, of uh, the justice system, that we find things like 95 day guys on death row who turned out to be innocent. My Lord, how dysfunctional is the system that could do that? Now, Medina was actually, the, the only thing that he, that you could really connect him to was a woman in a ditch. If I'm, if I'm remembering this right, um, I'm trying to go by memory, that he thought that she had an explosive. And did he shoot her or did his men shoot her? They're close. The woman was not in a ditch that's down. She was on a levee. That's up. She was pretending to be dead. Medina walked up to her. And as he turned away, he saw her move. And according to the evidence in the trial, a number of witnesses, he said, oh my God, a grenade, and whirled and shot at her. Another witness, I think it was a staff sergeant, said, I saw it all happen. He has told the truth, except he missed an I shot her. And we both thought that she was going to shoot us. That's one of the 102 murders that uh, um, didn't make a whole lot of sense as far as Medina was concerned. I, I understand. Now, another case I've noticed here as well was the uh, Boston Strangler and Al Albert DeSelvo. Um, yes. So, no, he actually confessed his guilt, asked the Bo Boston Strangler to you? Well, no, it, it happened this way, and it's much more convoluted than that. But I am able to boil it down for you uh, rather quickly. I had a client who was on under indictment for murder and was in the mental institution in Mass, he asked me to come talk to a guy and he kind of winked at me and said, I think he might be the strangler. I said, well, next time I see you, I'll give him a few minutes. I'm not really interested in that. I did talk with Albert Salvo and he made it pretty plain that he would like to write a book about strangling women if his family, not he, but his family, could get some income from it because he pretty much had figured out he was never going to be free again. So I followed up on that with some homicide detectives, figured out some questions that only the guilty party in each case would know. Albert answered all of them correctly, or at least very substantially correctly, and the investigation ceased. The focus was on Albert. The deal I made was, you can talk to him all you want, but only on the guardianship, which means he's incompetent to waive his Fifth Amendment rights, which means you can use anything you get to work on your cases, but you cannot use it against Albert Salvo. And I got that agreement, and I had his guardian appointed, and he gave 65 hours of detail about the strength, describing the homicides he'd committed, which we call 12 and a half, because one of the victims was 88, and we think she died of a heart attack, although there was evidence of a ligature around her neck. She just didn't live long enough to become strangled, but he gave 65 hours of description to the homicide chief of the Mass State Police, the homicide chief of Boston, an assistant attorney general, and the guardian who was the former commissioner of corrections and a lawyer. And uh, 
those tapes are out there in several places. Of course, I'm, I also wanted to ask you about Patty Hearst and the prosecution of her and kind of her comments as you having a disjointed closing argument, etc. and stuff. What's your memory of Patty Hearst? Well, my memory of Patty Hearst is that her evaluation of her trial uh, is very inaccurate. And I think not forthcoming, and I've always stood up to Patty Hearst, and I still do. I don't think she should have been convicted. The military court would never have convicted her because she was truly brainwashed. But Patty doesn't start in the right place, and maybe that's because she wasn't there. Two people who were, I'm no longer with us. Randy Hearst called me got right through the red tape to the warden and then to me when I was in prison with an inmate client in Jackson, Mississippi. And he said, I need you to come here as fast as you can. And so I hopped in my airplane, which I had with me, and flew to San Francisco and got in at one in the morning. And he said, I know you've read all about this. Patty's in a lot of trouble robbing banks, blowing up police stations, uh, police cars, and so forth. Only one case bothers us. It's first degree murder, and if she gets convicted there, our name could be uh, Paul Pius Hearst or the president, but she will never get out. I want you to handle my case and win anything you can along the way. That's exactly what we did. She admits in her book she got away with murder in the first degree. She does not say thank you for getting me out of that, but we negotiated with the FBI and the Justice Department, and she was never charged, although others were and others have pleaded to that crime who were in on the robbery where two people got murdered. As far as her case was concerned, I thought the judge did a terrible thing when he assured me and Patty that the bank robbery with the murder would never get brought into her bank robbery case in San Francisco, the you other know, was Sacramento, which was the Hibernia Bank. And then after I put her on the stand, because she was just about dead from lack of blood to the brain, as it turned out, few weeks later, he changed his mind and said, I'm going to let them ask about the Sacramento case. And there we stood. And so, 42 times she took the fifth. Most unfair thing I've seen happen in a federal court. Don't think she should have been convicted, but it is the worst case I have ever had in my life. So it's been, it, it, was a, it was a bad case. Do you, do you think she was involved with the Liberation Army? There is no question but when she was never involved with them until she got kidnapped. There is no question but when she got kidnapped. After that, we have her story without really much contradiction. But that was that she was kept in a closet, that she was allowed with a supervisor to go to the bathroom from time to time, and that the head of the self-styled rebellious unit, the SLA, Donald DeFries, or Sinku, as you like to be known, um, I think there's no question but what he had sex with her, and I've had to call it rape, when you lock someone in a closet. On many occasions, but ultimately, I think it's very clear that Patty Hearst was brainwashed into thinking the following. It's really a Stockholm syndrome case, which is a pretty well-known um, psychosomatic problem. <clears throat> and that is that you are convinced that your captors are your only chance that if you step outside the cocoon that they have woven for you, that machine guns will be waiting from 
all the bad guys, and uh, that includes all the cops, your parents, former friends, and so forth. So you better hang out with this group. It's your only salvation. We had pilots go through that uh, problem all the time. They made confessions to germ warfare, nuclear warfare, all kinds of bad things during the Korean War. And we finally learned there's no way to stop that process from being effective. And I had one Navy captain on the jury who said, I know all about brainwashing. I convened courts martial on it. And I have sat as a juror in such cases, and the government immediately threw them off. At that point, I knew that the government did not have an honest approach to the Hearst problem, which was huge. If Patty Hearst had been black or poor, she probably never would have been charged. If she had black, been black and poor, she was out the door before it ever closed. Mr. Bailey, I'm asking this question with as much respect as I can. Uh, Patty Hearst... Sounds like a bad question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. But I have to ask it you know, for the sake of the listeners that are going to ask us. Um, yes. In, in, in her memoirs, having read what she had written about her trial, she had some problems with your approaches. Um, would you describe for the listeners what it was like to represent her or some of the problems that she had with your representation? Well, Patty Harris is at best a quarterback with 2020 hindsight, but even if all her druthers had come true, once she took the Fifth Amendment, there was no way that her case on that bank robbery could have gone any other way. And on the one hand, I don't think she was a criminal. On the other hand, she, she should thank her lucky stars that she is not now in jail without having had any afterlife because whoever drives a getaway car in a bank robbery where murder is committed is liable for the murder. And she was liable uh, for the murder of the woman, pregnant woman, who got gunned down in bank robbery by Emily Harris, oddly enough, the woman who kidnapped Patty Hearst. And now they had a team. Patty, at the time of the trial, was little more than an otomy. She did what she was told she never had the basis for spirits or anything else to critique the trial, but I'm sure her publisher said, as many have said to me, you've got to spice this up a bit. And if you attack Ashley Bailey, that will always gets news. If you attack your defense lawyer, it almost always gets news. Because Patty has never said a word to me about any criticisms or shortcomings, if that had been her view, we would not have been kept on as the lawyers who appealed the case, and we were. You know, touche, you know, that, that, that's true. Um, because there were rumors, you know, that were floating around, and, and she alluded to these in her writings, you know, uh, about alcohol abuse or a flask and, and what have you. So, but but you continued to represent her even in the face of these rumors. It did did that um, affect your judgment at, at all? Uh, the rumors were never there. I was picked up in 1983, mm -hmm. long after the Hearst case has gone to bed, was no longer in litigation except in the executive clemency area, and Carter had given her a commutation and eventually couldn't pardon her. If Cardinal, Carter had pardoned her, by the way, the DA in Sacramento was going to indict her at state court for murder, and she would have had no defense, because although her statement to the FBI that she was there could not have been used against her, she wrote a book saying, I did it. 
And books are admissible evidence. People thought, I guess, that it was too late, nobody would bother, and might as well write the book. But all of that aside, quite um, not relevant to the Hearst case, except I think in the mind of the cop who arrested me, it may have been. I was no. stopped for going through a stop sign in San Francisco in 1982, I believe. I was tried before a jury in 1983, and the issue was, had I had too much to drink? They tried to bring in witnesses, and they did. Unfortunately for them, the witnesses said, Mr. Bailey never drinks too much, and we doubt that he did that night. And the jury came back with a verdict, of kind of like a snap. So, Patty's suspicion. Well, has never been fleshed out at all, and nor did she have that suspicion. Somebody said that to her long after the trial was over. I put no stock in it, and I doubt that if I were to have the ability to take her deposition today, she would be able to cite a single source except rumors, which are not admissible in any court in the world. Yes. Well, let me amend your statement by saying this. Um, you know, I worked in law enforcement, and I have for approximately about just about 20 years. And you have always been a hero of mine because you've overcome so much, and you have done so much, and you've worked on so many famous cases. But in your personal life, you have overcome these type of allegations, and you've always come out on top. I am a great friend of law enforcement. I am a member of a number of associations dominated by law enforcement. I think they do a great job. When they get vilified, it's the exception rather than the rule. And if one of my children had chosen law enforcement, I would have given him a pat on the back. Well, after the show's over, I need to get your number on speed dial just in case I ever need a good defense. You can do that. You have the number. Yeah. Just crank it in into that little computer you think is a telephone. Of course, we should talk about uh, the O.J. Simpson case. Um, yes. And um, how, how was your impression of how it was handled by the prosecution? The O.J. Simpson case is a blight on the history of the United States, and I can sum it up in no other way. It was a case that should not have been brought and would not have been if it were not for the fact that the LAPD was smarting from the consequences of the Rodney King case. They made several quantum leaps for lack of evidence, what Johnny Co Cochran called a rush to judgment. It was lousy police work. The prosecutors assigned should never have been involved in a murder case. If there had been a case against O.J., they would not have been able to make it out. But I must tell you, and I've been hired by L.A. to prosecute O.J. with a lot of experience and a lot of pretty good skills. I could not have made out a case against O.J. because it wasn't there. He had a timeline bar, also known as a component alibi. And that means that although no one can say they were with me, when the murder happened, I can prove that 20 minutes before that, I was with Al Warren, and 10 minutes before that, I was with Lee Bailey, and 12 minutes after it happened, I was with Bill Belichick, and 20 minutes after it happened, I was with Tom Brady. So, unless you believe at least one, and probably more of these people, 
I could not have committed the crime. And we had that kind of evidence, along with much, much more, for O.J. The jury fastened on it very quickly. We think the amount of time they deliberated is probably less than an hour. We know they signed the verdict form uh, within three hours of having gotten the case. And yet, never in my life have I seen the public turn on someone acquitted by the jury and say that the jury was racist, that they were stupid, all the things that dishonor one American to another. And the case is a mess. Before I die, which isn't going to happen for a while, you bad guys, before I die, I will straighten out the O.J. Simpson case. But it ain't happened yet in 24 years. How, how do you plan on doing that? Several ways. Uh, there is, first of all, there was a good reaction by the public to O.J.'s testimony at the parole hearing. He did not testify in either the L.A. or the Las Vegas trial. Public didn't get a look at him. He's a very good witness, I think. Um, if O.J. Simpson ever kills anybody, it will be by talking them to death. A violent man with weapons, he is not. He is a garrulous man. I have introduced him to many people. He's a nice man, but he made a good impression on the public at the parole hearing. He's being released October 1. Uh, I can tell you, CBS is planning to air a special on his California case on September 30. And NBC has done a special focusing on the robbery case in Las Vegas, and that I'm told we'll air late this year or early next. I don't think they have a date or an event. To pin it to, there is a major movie um, now, I'd say, well, toward the production stages. That will uh, give the public a much better insight in O.J. than they've seen so far. And O.J.'s chief investigator and I who found the Furman tapes, the touchstone of the Simpson case. Uh, we are writing a book about the case, which I hope to have on the street next summer. Well, Mr. Bailey, can, can I please ask you a question? This is something that has plagued me ever since the OJ case started. Sure. They have got pictures of him getting onto a plane with a gym bag. Now, in the very beginnings of the OJ case, they made a big deal about what is in this gym bag. Why are they letting him leave with a gym bag? Yes. And, you know, you know, thinking like a law enforcement officer, that could be a hell of a lot of evidence. You know, that could be the pipes, that could be the bloody clothes, that could be anything. And then they never mentioned it again. Okay. Do you know why? And I well, learned, I'm, my memory is not flawless, but it's as close as you're likely to see. And when it comes to the OJ case, I can pull almost any detail out of the ones that I can't pull up. Pat McKenna, my chief investigator, can. The answer to your question is, they wondered about the gym bag or suit bag, and they asked that it be open. Robert Kardashian, uh, who had OJ at his home at the time, opened the bag, photographed his contents, so nothing in it, and so that supposed piece of evidence with bloody clothes and crap like that, which was preposterous. I mean, the gym bag was coming back from Chicago. He got on the plane to Chicago with it, and who would take bloody clothes to Chicago and then bring them back so the cops might catch them? 
it, it was one of the very many, and this is tragic, I think, the very many silly points of the O.J. Simpson trial. It was much more circuits than trial. There was no green team involved. Um, it was a trial of many mistakes and much wasted time, but it was a trial about only one issue at the end of the day. How did the glove that had once been on the hand of the killer get to O.J.'s house? It seems like there are only two answers. Did O.J. plant it there, or did Furman drop it there to keep himself in a case where he had just been relieved of duty in favor of to more senior detectives. And the answer is very simple. You'll find it on my website, baileyandelliot.com, which contains not only the Thurman tapes, where he, I think on 42 occasions, describes black people in an unflattering way, but you also have an experiment we conducted that proved that O.J. couldn't undrop the glove which leaves Mark Thurman. And that issue is going to be fleshed out much better in the book I'm working on, hopefully in the movie in which I'm collaborating than it ever has been before. Mr. Bailey, <laughs> sir, I, I, I'm not going to let you off the hook just yet. Because I, I work in most of the time when you must. <laughs> oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But we, we've got to explain then how O.J. had marks on his hand that may be consistent with a stabbing. Okay. The answer to that is he did not. There were no defensive wounds. One of the very few good things Bob Shapiro did in the case early on was to bring in Dr. Wayne Heisinger, who is a very good man, a very good doctor, and who conducted the experiment that showed that O.J. could not have planted the glove. Heisinger inspected O.J. top to bottom to see if he had any wounds, lesions, or abrasions that might be consistent with having been involved in a fight where the victim got stabbed with the knife 17 times, that being Ron Golden. In Nicole's case, she wasn't stabbed that many times, but they all would cut her head off. They severed the neck from the head. Yes, it terrible. Yes, so, so, um, <clears throat> There I had the doctor examine O.J. to show where he was not hurt. There was a cut on his finger. That is so well accounted for. With a broken glass with his blood on it in a bathroom in the hotel in Chicago where he had planned to stay, his wrapping some towel around it, going down to the front desk saying, I've got to go back to L.A., I won't be at the golf tournament. Could you give me a bandage? That witness gave a statement. They did, and that is the only wound on his body obviously made by that broken glass because he was holding it when he got the call from Detective Ron Phillips. Nicole has been murdered, and he crushed the glass and broke it. Any more questions about the evidence, gentlemen? <laughs> No, I was going to say, <laughs> Pat McKenna, he, uh, he's the same guy that uh, Casey Anthony is living with, isn't, isn't he? He is, I mean, you know, if you want to pursue this line or do another program, Pat McKenna would be a great guy to talk to because Pat did the grunt work. He found the fermentation, and the way he did it, by the, uh, the edge of his fingernails hanging off a cliff shows you the difference between a routine investigator asks questions and a really good investigator who gets answers. And he did 
And although I think we had won the case easily without the tapes, where the public was concerned, it showed that Furman was both a racist and a liar, and I think they were very valuable, unfortunately. And this is what people don't know, and if you invite them to look at the website, they will discover. We got cut off about 20% of the way through our defense investigation for one reason. We had 14 jurors left, one was 73, one was complaining about what sounds like angina pains, and that would have brought us to 12. If we had lost one more juror, the ability to go forward and finish the case would have depended on the prosecution saying we will agree to go forward with less than 12. And Marcia Clark told the judge, no way, we want the mistrial. People who think they put it in a good case usually don't ask for a mistrial. Wow. So now, who do you think did it then? Or do you, did you find a, a suspect? I, well, again, there's so much that's off the radar. Uh, the FBI did some inquiries, and then the LAPD, although using their experts, kind of invited them to stay out so LAPD could get the credit. And uh, their best info was that Faye Resnick, who had been living with Nicole to the day before the murder, owed substantial funds for the purchase of cocaine, and that she was institutionalized the day before the murder. Some hitman trying to collect the money for the cocaine thought to be about 30 grand, came to get it and thought Nicole was Fay. And when Nicole gave them a very hard time, as I'm fairly sure she did, it was her way. She got her throat cut. And while she was dying, Ron Goldman came down from a restaurant less than a block away to return some eyeglasses that Nicole's mother had left when Nicole and her mother had eaten there an hour before. That's the best we can piece it together because the LAPD spends so much energy prosecuting OJ. If the killer came forward today and said, I can prove I did it, here's pictures of me cutting her throat, they would uh, probably kill the killer and the photographer. Well, you've had uh, quite the uh, career, and uh, and you just keep on going. So so that's kind of what's next, then. You're kind of working on a book about the O.J. Simpson case. I, mean, I must tell you, the book is damn near written. I mean, it's been 25 years. McKenna and I have both lectured all over the place on the O.J. case, and we're I, I think uh, echoes crying in the wind, but we don't give up. And now I think the tide is turning. And the reason I think it's turning is because people of my generation are hopeless. I don't even bother to try and persuade them. People of the next one down, not that much better. But the millennia that are coming behind them, they kind of have open minds. And if I live long enough, I'll get to address a whole bunch of them, and the OJ case may get revisited by impartial minds, and that's kind of a, on my bucket list. Well, that that is a really interesting point of view, and it's really good to hear someone uh, be a little bit more um, hopeful and positive about the uh, younger generations. Well. I think there are a lot of things that this generation has done badly. Uh, my good friend Tom Broca, I'm sure, agrees with that. He's the one that wrote the book, The Greatest Generation. We just had an election where there was at least a facade that Make America Great Again was a slogan. Uncle Sam and the war bonds 
uh, that hasn't happened. It's not going to happen. And I think we've got to wait at least another election because President of the United States has become, in the minds of many, such a crummy job that the people who should be applying for it say, I don't want to grief. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's... You're, you're correct. <laughs> Endless challenge, and uh, you're correct about Well, let me put it this way. I wouldn't accept the office if I were elected by acclamation. Yeah. 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 It's an uphill battle, sure. and uh, you're right. But my hat's off to any of the younger people who say we're going to do it a different way. How stupid can these people be that they're threatening to blow each other off the face of the earth, threatening to shut off trade between the biggest economy in the world, and maybe the second biggest economy. These are all Nazi ideas, and they are floating now. And I hope better minds and stouter hands will eventually get a grip on this stuff. But right now, I see two madmen out there calling each other names. Yeah. Oh, yeah, a lot <laughs> of the world does. In fact, uh, the majority of the world does. I agree with you there. I have a special affection for Korea because I enlisted in the Navy for the purpose of defending South Korea. Mm. Well, Mr. Bailey, this has been an incredible interview. We've, we've really enjoyed having you, and, and I hope that you're able to come back uh, when you are going to launch your book. Okay. We'll certainly uh, give you a shout. If there's a minute or two where you could mention it. Oh, of course. It'd be our pleasure. Okay. It's an honor to speak with you, sir. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. To find out more about our show, guests, or listen to a previous show, visit our website at www.somethingweirdmedia.com. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.